Amen. Good evening. Go ahead and open up to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Hey, if you're there, say amen. Okay, we're almost there. Robert's Philippians chapter 3. Oh, thanks. Okay, yeah. Go get my Bible. Yeah, go get your Bible, bro. All right, beginning in verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worships God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. So having gone through the first two chapters, Philippians chapter 1, Philippians 1, Paul talked about the single mind, and he said, to me to live is Christ. And so his mind was just set on living for Christ. He had a singular mind. There was no idols. There was no other pursuits. His main pursuit was Jesus Christ. So single mind. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul talked about the submitted mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And we, we went over that pretty extensively. And so now that we get into Philippians chapter 3, Paul's going to be talking about the selfless mind. And he's going to be talking about being a servant. And so, talking about the selfless mind, he begins verse 1 by saying, finally, and maybe some of you are saying that tonight, finally we get to chapter 3, 15 studies in the first two chapters. I don't know if anyone's ever done that, I don't recommend it, but needless to say, finally Paul says, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Now the reason why Paul told the Philippians to rejoice in the Lord was because there was these Judaizers. And these Judaizers were these Christians, and emphasis on the air quotes. There were these Christians. They claimed to be Christians. They were ex-Pharisees and rabbis and theologians and scholars and so forth who taught that all born-again believers had to also keep the law of Moses. That was their thing. That in order for you Gentiles, non-Jews, to be born again, you have to, you must keep the law of Moses. It means you have to be circumcised, you have to keep the customs, you got to keep the Sabbath in order for you to be born again, in order for you to prove that you are a person that belongs to God. And so these Judaizers were going from church to church preaching this doctrine, this false doctrine that was greatly troubling the churches. And the Philippians were greatly troubled by it to the point to where Paul had to tell them, rejoice in Christ Jesus. And so these Judaizers were going around saying that they, Gentiles, weren't really born again. They were saying things like, Paul had only told you half of the truth, but we come to tell you the rest of the truth. We have the whole truth. We got other books and magazines and organizations that you just don't know about, but if you come with us, we will share you the secrets and the things and so forth. And so they were accusing Paul of lying, basically, of only telling them half-truths. That if they wanted to really born again, that if they really wanted to be spiritual, if they really wanted to experience God, if they wanted to be pleasing to God, that on top of having faith in Christ Jesus, they had to also keep the law of Moses. Well, this troubled the Philippians because the main thing that they were talking about was circumcision. And that greatly troubled the mostly Gentile Philippians. 
And the reason why Paul says the mutilation is because that's exactly the point that they were emphasizing. You've got to understand that before Christ, circumcision was the way that you showed that you were dedicated to God. And so these false teachers were saying, you ain't dedicated to God. Sure, you've given your life to Jesus, but you're not dedicated to God. Well, how so? Well, you're not circumcised. You're still Gentiles. You must be circumcised in order for you to really be born again. You're halfway there, basically, is what they were saying. What a comfortable topic that we're talking about tonight, right? But this is the main thing. This was a huge thing in the, in the New Testament. And you'll see it over and over and over again, Paul having to address it, having to talk about it, having to remind the churches it's in Christ Jesus and in Christ Jesus alone. And so these teachings, these false teachers brought doubt into their faith. It brought insecurity and unsurety in their faith in Christ. It rocked their confidence in the rock of their salvation. They were left questioning and wondering, and even, even being suspect that Paul was only telling them half of the truth, that perhaps Paul himself was either deceived and or that he was deceiving them. And so it really just confused them and it rocked them. And that's the reason why Paul starts chapter 3 with, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Why? To remind them, to strengthen them, to encourage them and to assure them. And if there's anyone here tonight that you just think, I've given my life to Jesus, but I just don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if I have true faith. I don't know if I'm truly born again. You ever have those thoughts? I know I did from time to time, and sometimes I still question, I wonder sometimes. But then I gotta go back to the Word of God. And that's what Paul did. He took him back to the Word of God. He brought him back to Jesus, rejoice in the Lord, to remind them, to strengthen them, to encourage them, and to assure them. And if any of you here are questioning your salvation, you're wondering if your faith is good enough. Remember what Jesus said about the size of a mustard seed. Remember what he said? Faith is as big as a mustard seed. That's enough to get things started. So the fact that you're here tonight, and the fact that you're even contemplating it, even worried about it, and you're wondering, I don't think I'm born again. Pastor Chuck Smith would say, just because you're thinking about it, just because you're worried, shows that you're born again. It shows that it's working in you. But perhaps you're doubting, perhaps you're questioning, and I hope that tonight, after we go through this study, you'll be able to rejoice in the Lord. And I love what he says in verse 1. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. I don't mind having to tell you over again. I don't mind retelling you the gospel. I don't mind reminding you. I don't mind retelling you how it all works. And to retell you once again that they're false teachers teaching false doctrines. I don't mind that. It's not tedious for me because for you, it is safe. See, that's what I want. I want you to be safe. And so it's not tedious for me because I see that you're troubled. And what I see in that is Paul's love for the Philippians. That TLC for the Philippians. He really cared about them. He wasn't like, oh man, here we go again. When are you gonna grow up? When are you gonna get it? No, hey, I, I see that you're troubled. And so I wanna comfort you and I want to encourage you because the main thing that I want is I want you to feel safe in Christ Jesus. I want you to know that you're safe in faith, that you're safe in the kingdom of God. And for us, it should never be tedious. It should never be tedious for us to reassure God's people of God's love. As a matter of fact, I think that should be some of the one of the main things that we do when we come to church, when we come to church, that we would pray, Lord, if there's an opportunity for me to encourage a brother or a sister, to reassure them of your love, amen, use me, I'm willing, and that you will look for those opportunities to remind people of God's love. And that's the reason why I love it, that during worship, when you pray and you, and you talk about God's love or someone quotes a verse, or, that's reminding us of God's love. And I want to encourage you to continue to do that because there are times when I need reassurance of his love. I need to be reminded of his love. It should never be tedious for us to remind God's people of God's word. Never. You know, I have people come up to me and say, oh, George, I'm sorry, man. I feel like every time I talk to you, I'm always bringing my problems to you. And I'm like, hey, it's all good. Amen. I see that it troubles you. It's not tedious for me. I care about you. I want you to be safe. And so therefore, I comfort them and I encourage them because I want them to have that joy in the Lord. I remember, you know, when I was young in my faith, 
I uh, got the opportunity to go to, I forget if it was Arizona or El Cajon down in, in um, Southern Cali, um, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and basically to invite people to this Christian play that we were putting up. And what happened was I got the opportunity to share my testimony, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I was all about it. I was excited. I could sense the spirit uh, working in me, working through me. Um, I, I was just delighted to be serving God. Well, one day I came up against this Jehovah Witness. Ooh. And as we started talking, as I was sharing my testimony with him, he began to question me. Really? You really believe in what you're saying? Of course I do. And then he, st- then he came at me with his theology and his doctrine. He pulls out a Bible, plap, starts flipping it all over the place, quoting scriptures like, I mean, this guy was eloquent, and to me, he was like a scholar. And I would try to come up with stuff that I had heard, maybe kind of pieced together and stuff. And, but compared to him, I was elementary. And he could, he could sense the insecurity. He could see the panic, because I was panicking. I'm like, oh man, I've never had this happen before. And he capitalized on that. And I remember having, he had a smirk in his face, like, dude, I got you, basically. I got you. And then we started talking about the Trinity. Oh, man. And I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to answer. But he knew how to answer. He knew how to deal with me, and quote, unquote, manipulate me. And I just got frustrated. I think I said something childish, like, well, you know what? You're dumb, and you're false, and I'm out of here. You know what I mean? And, and I try to act like it didn't affect me. But inside, I was deeply troubled. For the rest of that day, I couldn't preach the gospel anymore. And the reason why was because I was no longer as confident as I was before. Because I was questioning now, am I believing in something false? Is the Trinity a false doctrine? Am I going to hell? Oh, wait a minute, according to Jehovah's Witnesses, I'm just going to die. But needless to say, am I believing in the wrong thing? And it rocked me. I kid you not, I was depressed for the rest of the day. And, you know, I just kind of shook it off as time went on. But then months later, it came back again. I would remember that conversation that I had with that Jehovah's Witness, and once again, I would feel that that fear creep in, that intimidation, that feeling of intimidation, butterflies in my stomach. I just got anxious and nervous whenever I would think about that. I'd do my best to shake it off, but, but it got to the point where I couldn't shake it off anymore. I really began to question what I was learning. I began to question my faith in Christ, and I began to question Calvary Chapel, because here's where I was coming. So what did I do? I went to my youth pastor, and I go, youth pastor, check it out, man. This is what I've been dealing with inside. I don't know if I believe in the Trinity. How do we know that we're right? How do we know that they're wrong? And him and his love, he opened up the scriptures and began to preach to me the gospel. He began to show me the Trinity and and the scripture. He began to give me the history of Jehovah's Witnesses. And after we were done talking, I'm like, cool. All right, amen. Sweet. And then a couple of months later, it hit me again. And so I'd go up to the youth pastor again. Hey, man, I know we talked about it already, but I'm fearing again. I'm nervous again. Can you reassure me? And he did. And I did this for a couple of years. You guys, this was a big thing in my life. Like, it really affected me. When I read about what the Philippians and being troubled, I can relate with that. I know what it's like to be rocked. And for a couple of years, I would go up to the youth pastor from time to time and just go, can you reassure me again? And he never said, George, seriously, man, when are you going to get it? I'm sick and tired of telling you over. He never did that. He just sat down and said, all right, let's do it again. And, and he would just flip to the pages, teach me, reassure me. And the reason why is because he knew that I was troubled. And what he wanted is he wanted me to be safe. And so every time I see them, I remember that day. And I tell you what, that really had a profound effect on my life. But when Paul says, but for you it is safe, this word safe means to be secure, to be sure, to confirm, to be certain, and to be firm on. It's the opposite of failing. Paul didn't want them to fail. The youth pastor did not want me to fail. He wanted me to be secure, to be sure, to be confirmed, to be certain, to be firm upon. That's what he wanted. And that's why Paul's like, it's not tedious for me. My desire is for you to know that you believe in the truth and that the truth is the truth and nothing but the truth. So help me. 
man, all right, two, three, all right, not bad, not bad. So then he goes on to say in verse two, beware of dogs. We see those signs everywhere. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. Again, mutilation. That's the reason why he says mutilation. Paul's being sarcastic because he knows that the issue here is circumcision. Yep, I know what they're saying. I know exactly what they're preaching, and I know why you're troubled. And so he says, beware of the mutilation. You guys know that I just came back from India, and this is what you see in India everywhere. North, south, east, and I'm sure west. We didn't get to go to the west side, but I'm sure it's the same thing. These dogs know how to multiply, and they all look the same. Look at them. But they just run wild over there. There's a whole bunch of dogs, and they're not the kind that you're like, oh, come here. You don't do that to them. You're like, oh, ooh, unclean, dirty. Because they are. They're absolutely dirty. All just nasty. And so looking at these dogs and seeing these dogs in India, when Paul says, beware of dogs, why? Because they're dirty. Because these dogs are scavengers. Because they're opportunistic. And they're self-serving. And so these Judaizers were selfish for power and envious of Paul. They were opportunistic scavengers wanting people to follow them. They were prideful, wanting people to regard them as extra pious and spiritual. They wanted to matter. We're going to see that in a little bit. But that's the reason why he says, beware of these dogs. These dogs don't care about anything. And when in India, that's what you see. These dogs are all about themselves. That's it. They will fight one another to get the food. There's no sharing. There's no, he's my road dog. There's no none of that over there. It's all or nothing in India. And that's how these guys were. They were all or nothing. It's all about me. So what Paul does is he points out that these are in fact evil workers because they're actual false teachers. They're rejectors of God's word and they're disobedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Well, how so? You got to understand that this problem started way back in Acts 15. The first time Gentiles started giving their lives to Jesus, they had a big old meeting. Hey, we thought only the Jews would be able to give their lives to Jesus, but now we see the Holy Spirit coming upon the Gentiles. Should we make them follow the law of Moses? Should we make them become circumcised in order for them to be born again? And so after this discussion, James stands up and he quotes Amos chapter 9, verses 11 through 12, and he says, after this, quoting God, after this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. After quoting these verses, this is what James said. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. In other words, we don't have to make them become circumcised, nor do they have to keep the law of Moses. Because God has prophesied from even back then that Gentiles would eventually give their lives to him. And if the Holy Spirit fell upon them before they were circumcised, before they even started keeping the law of Moses, why should we trouble them? And so that was James' conclusion. And the disciples and the apostles agreed that God had called the Gentiles to salvation. Even when they weren't keeping the law of Moses, therefore they weren't required to keep the law of Moses. But here's where the problem happened. Some of them disagreed. They're like, nah, man, no, no, no. That can't possibly be the counsel. That cannot possibly be God's will. And so they departed from the disciples and the apostles. Others saw this as an opportunity for them to gain power, for them to stroke their ego, for them to, um, you know, gain clout. And so we see in Acts 17, verse 5, that some of the Jews became envious when people from their synagogue took heed to Paul's teaching. And so what these leaders, these synagogues were doing is they started bringing false accusations and persecution on Paul. And what would happen is, as Paul would start these churches and then he would move on and start other churches, these false teachers would come behind Paul to spread their false doctrines. And this had been going on for 15 years. Here's Paul in prison writing to the Philippians 15 years later after Acts 17, Acts 15, and he's still dealing with the same thing. You could sense the frustration when he says that they're dogs and that they're evil workers because they're still at it. Man, this has been since day one, and it's probably going to continue till the rapture. 
It's going to happen till the end of the world. But just know who you believe in. Rejoice in Christ Jesus. So once again, Paul reminds them that they are the circumcision. True circumcision. Verse 3, who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. I mean, he summarizes it. He summarizes their entire walk. He summarizes the entire relationship into three points. We worship God in the spirit, we rejoice in Christ Jesus, and we have no confidence in the flesh. That is what makes us true born again believers. Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul so that you may live. This is something that God said as he was giving Moses the law. So from the very start of the law, God meant circumcision to be of the heart. That circumcision outside, the outward circumcision, is really just symbolic of that which is inside. And so that was the point, and that's the reason why he says, moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants, that you may love your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. And then again, in Jeremiah chapter 4, the Lord says, circumcise yourselves to the Lord and remove the foreskins of your heart, the hardness of your heart, that which gets in the way of having a relationship with God. Get rid of that, men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, or else my wrath will go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. Again, it's an inward thing more than an outward thing. And then when we get into the New Testament, here's Paul writing to the Colossians, in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. See, what God is looking for is that we die to sin, that we may live for God. What God is looking for is for us to put off the old man, to put off, to get rid of, to repent of sin, to cut ourselves off from sin and to turn to God. That is the circumcision of Christ. And then in Romans, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter whose praise is not from men, but from God. So again, over and over again, he says, what God is looking for are for those whose hearts are given to the Lord. Those who have repented of sin and have given their lives to Jesus Christ those who live for God. So true circumcision is of the heart, meaning I have repented. I've been cut off from sin to live for God. I have placed my trust not in my flesh, which would be good works. And that's what happened with the law of Moses. What ended up happening was, well, as long as I do more good works than bad works, I'm safe. And others were like, it's all about good works. And so they would give themselves over to keeping the law of Moses as best as they could, and then they would walk around like, see, I'm saved. And so what Paul is saying is, no, 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 you can't even put your confidence in your flesh, meaning your good works. Even if you're the best Jew, if you're the best Pharisee, the most behaved Gentile, that's not going to get you to heaven. There is none who is righteous, no, not one. God is holy, holy, holy. Sin will not dwell with God. God will not uh, dwell with sin. He has to judge it. Justice has to happen. And therefore, he pours his wrath out upon those who continue in sin. We cannot put our confidence in our good behavior. Church attendance. How how often we read the Bible. How much we tithe or whatever. That's not the way it works. Our confidence is in Christ and in Christ alone, as Paul says. True circumcision is of the heart. Those who are saved and therefore worship God in the spirit Rejoice in Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So be careful with the complicators. Be careful with them. Be careful with the ones who complicate the simplicity of the gospel. People have been asking me, hey man, so what was it that you got out of India? And I would say this, how simply they love God and how simply they believe in Jesus. They just keep it simple over there. They just love God with all of their heart, and it's not complex, it's not complicated. They just worship the Lord. They pray to the Lord over everything, and they're acutely aware of their sinfulness 
but they're also really aware of his goodness and his grace and his mercy. What I see there in India is they just simply worship the Lord and they simply live their lives before the Lord. They just keep it simple. It's the simplicity of the gospel. And those who complicate the simplicity of the gospel, the ones who say, no, no, you've got to be baptized in our temples and cathedrals in order for you to be saved. No, 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 you need to subscribe to our books and magazines and go to our organization for you to know the whole truth. Or the ones who say, no, no, you have to speak in tongues in order for you to be saved. If you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. Those people. And those people are preaching that every single day, all the time. And it becomes this works thing. And even the ones with the health and wealth, you've got to be careful with them too. Well, hey, be tithe, I'll give you a blessing. And you will know all things, all mysteries and all that. You've got to be careful with them complicators. Look at this. John 3.16. You can get the whole entire gospel in just one verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now remember, Jesus did not say this to a child or to an elementary person. He said this to Nicodemus, who was a scholar, an educated man. And even Jesus was taken back. Nicodemus, are you a teacher of the law and you don't understand the simplicity of it? It's simple. This is how simple it is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's it. One verse. And there's the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's nothing about us having to do works in order to be saved. For it is the work of God in him giving his son. And it's the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and the work of the Spirit sanctifying us. That's the only work that matters. And we cannot place our faith upon our performance and our works. We must place our faith in God's love, the work of Jesus Christ dying on the cross, and the Holy Spirit working in us. That's why Paul said in Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. It's God that's doing the work in us. So Paul once again reminds them that they are of the true circumcision. Those who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Even the sinner's prayer, look how simple it is. I prayed something like this. God, I, I come before you a sinner. Please forgive me. Jesus, come into my life. I no longer put my trust in myself, but in you. I no longer want to live for myself, but for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And if an unbeliever prays that with their heart, they're born again. They become saved right there. Pastor Steve on Sunday mornings does that. And it's not some complex, crazy prayer. Just repeat after me, Lord, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Jesus, come into my life. I give myself to you. And that's it. And if you just pray that prayer with me, raise your hand. And when they raise, we really believe that they're born again right then and there. I gave my life to Jesus under the influence of drugs in juvenile hall. I didn't know anything about the Trinity. I didn't know anything about pre-tribulation. I didn't know anything about that. All I knew was, I'm in big trouble. I don't like where my life is going. And I know that God loves me. Jesus died on the cross. So Lord, I give my life to you. Please come into my life. And that was it. That was it. I didn't go to theology school to know anything or everything. I just knew God loved me and Jesus died on the cross for me. Look at the thief on the cross. His prayer was even more simple than that. He said, Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. That was his prayer. He just looked at Jesus and he said, will you remember me when you go into your kingdom? Look what Jesus said. And Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Simple. Absolutely simple. Simple for kids to give their lives to Jesus. We preach the gospel to you see the, the kids in the bottom. We preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. And we believe that if they believe the gospel and they give their lives to the Lord, they're born again. Connor, he's four years old. Four-year-old Connor has given his life to Jesus. My son, Levi, seven years old, has been born again for years, I could say. He gave his life to Jesus, I think, the first VBS. You know how many kids give their lives to Jesus on VBS? Remember the outreach that we had out in the park? I got the opportunity to share the gospel the audience was mostly kids. I shared it as simple as I could. And then I asked them, would you like to give your life to Jesus? A bunch of little hands popped up. And I believe that they understood 
God's love, Jesus died for them, and them having to give their lives to Jesus. And when they raised their hands and we prayed, led them to the Lord, they became born again. I believe that with all my heart. It's that simple, the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Connor and Levi, do they know the doctrine of the Trinity? Whoa, whoa, hold up, hold up. Now, before we say they're born again, are they pre-trib? Are they? Have they mastered the six fundamental principles in Hebrews chapter 6? Have they mastered that? Do they believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ? Can they even say the word imminent? Has Levi ever even said the word imminent? No, he hasn't. Well, how do you know he's born again then? Because he knows that God loves him. He knows that Jesus died on the cross, and he knows that he needs to give his life to Jesus. And when we asked him, do you want to give your life to Jesus? He said, yeah. And we prayed with him, and he gave his life to Jesus. Simple as that. Sometimes we complicate it, don't we? Sometimes we make it complex, more complex than it should be. Sometimes we kind of murk it with works and performance and comparisons and all this and all of that, and condemnation turned into, or conviction turned into condemnation. And, you know, sometimes we got to go to the basics. I think that's why Paul said, rejoice in Christ Jesus. Go back to the simplicity of Jesus Christ. So, ooh, I got five minutes. Here we go. But, Paul, here's the problem. These are scholars and rabbis and Pharisees, eloquent theologians that are telling us these things. These are leaders of our societies, leaders of synagogues. They're seemingly pious and ultra-spiritual. Paul, these guys are no joke. They got PhDs and all kinds of other letters behind their names. Like, they know what's up. And so then Paul goes, really? They're talking about their credentials. Let me remind you of my credentials. And so he goes for it circumcised on the eighth day. In other words, before I even had any control over my life, I was a Jew observing the law because my mom and my dad were Jewish and they were observing the law of Moses, which says that every male child should be circumcised on the eighth day. So before I even had any control, I was already following the law of Moses, circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel which means that I can actually trace my lineage all the way to the original 12. Well, which one were you? Of the tribe of Benjamin. Oh, Benjamin. See, that's an extra special tribe. And the reason why was because the tribe of Benjamin was the only one that remained faithful to the tribe of Judah. You see, the other 10 tribes left Judah and became enemies of Judah. But the tribe of Benjamin were like, no, this is the the lineage of David. We will stay with the lineage of David. We will stay with God's anointed. And so the tribe of Benjamin never left. And so the south was made up of Judah and Benjamin. And the north was made up of the other 10 tribes. Now Judah is extra special because hey, that's where the Messiah is going to come from, from the line of Judah. But Benjamin is special because they were faithful to the lineage of the Messiah. So of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews. You know what that means? It means this. I can look at my dad's lineage, and I can tell you from me through my dad all the way to Benjamin, no Gentiles. And I could also look at my mom's lineage. And from me to my mom all the way to Benjamin, no Gentiles. Pure Jews. Hebrew of Hebrews. Concerning the law, I was a Pharisee. Most disciplined, hardcore keepers of the law ever. Concerning zeal, what kind of a Pharisee was I? I was the kind that persecuted that which threatened the law of Moses. Not only did I argue, I went after and killed some of these people who were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how zealous I was for the law. I killed people. I was the one that said, kill Stephen, the first martyr. It was Paul who said, kill him for blasphemy. And then he dedicated himself to destroy this gospel that was being preached. And so he set out to destroy this church that called upon Christ as the Messiah. That's how zealous he was. And concerning righteousness, he says blameless. So what does that mean? Does that mean that he was perfect? No. It just means that in comparison to his peers, what his peers would say about him, they would be able to say, he is not a hypocrite, he is not a fake, he is for real, he is the real deal. That all of his peers, and even the Pharisees before him and so forth, would be able to look at Paul and go, this guy, this guy's no joke. 
This guy's for real. He was blameless in keeping the law of Moses. I mean, Paul was all about it. And so he reminds them, verses 5 and 6, of his credentials to basically say this. If you think they're dedicated, don't forget I was more dedicated. And I say to you, it's all about Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. These things, he says in verse 7, were gained to me. These things I have counted as loss for Christ. you got to understand, where Paul was and where he was going, these were gained to him at one point. It brought about privileges and power. It is most likely that if Paul would have continued going the way he was going, he would have either become the high priest or just as famous, if not even more famous, than his teacher, Gamaliel. Gamaliel was one of the most famous Pharisees of all time, to this day. And he saw something in Paul that made him go, Paul, follow me. Paul was a disciple of Gamaliel. And he was all about it. Paul was going to become something. He had great honor and privileges, but in comparison to knowing Christ, Paul considered those things as obsolete and of no further use. That's what that word loss means, obsolete doesn't mean anything to me anymore. It, it was everything to me, but now it's obsolete. It means nothing. I have no use for those things. And Paul continued to view those things as lost and rubbish. I love the way he says it in verse 8. I counted all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Rubbish. In England, that means trash. In Hebrew, it means something else. This is basically what he's saying. I count all things as obsolete in comparison to the excellent privilege of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I continually consider all things of no use compared to him, and continually count them as dung that I may gain Christ. What I love about Paul is that he wasn't one who gave it up and then later on in life was like, I kind of miss that. I kind of miss that. When I used to be so on fire for Jesus, but now he's relaxing a little bit. Oh, he was hardcore for Jesus. No longer am I going to, you know, cuss, and, and no longer am I going to surround myself with, you know, sinfulness and waste time. But then as life goes on 10, 20 years from now, and it's almost like, well, hey, and just kind of loosen up a little bit on, you know, our dedication onto the Lord. Paul was never like that. Paul was continually, do I consider all things of no use, and continually count them as dung. There was no backsliding in Paul. When he gave his life to Jesus, he just kept going forward. Sometimes I look at my life, and when I first gave my life to Jesus, I was hardcore about some things. But 10, 20 years later, I wasn't as hardcore. I was okay with compromising with some of that. I'm not a baby Christian anymore. I can handle it. Maybe back then, if I had those things, maybe it would stumble me, but I'm more mature now, so I can handle it now, and the compromises begin to happen. We got to be careful with that. See, with Paul, there was none of that. He just said, no, you know what? When I repented, I repented. When, when, I, when I saw those things as rubbish, I continually see those things as rubbish. There was no compromise for him. And so for Paul, knowing Jesus Christ in a personal relationship was more excellent than his achievements and discipline. Knowing Jesus was far greater than working hard to be the man that he once was. And I want to close with this. Paul continued to grow in Christ. He never stopped growing. He kept growing. Paul continued to know Christ. Paul continued to be founded in Christ. You know when he said that we are of the circumcision those who worship God in the Spirit, those who rejoice in Christ Jesus, and those who put their confidence not in their flesh. You know what that reminds me of? You know what it looks like in real life, daily life for us? Devotions. That's what we are to do every single day. In Psalm 5, King David said, Before my day starts, you will hear my voice in the morning, O Lord. He was just so dedicated. Lord, before I get busy with today's business, before I get distracted with life, I'm going to first come to you, and I'm going to worship you 
in the Spirit. And I'm going to rejoice in Christ Jesus because I'm saved. And I'm going to make sure that I don't put my confidence in my flesh. I'm going to put my confidence in you. That's devotions. And the fact that Psalms 5 says, in the morning you will hear my voice, I believe that should be us. I believe that we should start our day with the Lord and close our day with the Lord. And then ask the Lord, speak to me even in my dreams, Lord. Speak to me even in your dreams, God. Give me vision and understanding. But during the day, give me the strength to be dedicated to you. Do you count all things as loss? Do you continually count all things as loss? Or, or have you brought some of that old behavior back? Have you compromised a little bit? Maybe when you first gave your life to Jesus, perfect, blameless. But now, hey, 10, 20 years later, hey, well, you know, I'm allowed of this, a little bit of that. Be careful with that. Continue to consider those things as rubbish in comparison to knowing Jesus Christ in a personal relationship. Amen? Amen. Father, we come before you. We thank you, God, for speaking to our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us of the simplicity of the gospel. And I pray for us it would always be simple, that even our vision would be simple to love you and to love people, that our relationship with you would be simple. Help us not to get it all complicated, to be all complex. Help us, Lord, to simply love you, to simply worship you, to simply rejoice in your son Jesus, and to simply not put any confidence in our own selves and our own works and our flesh, but to put all of our confidence in you. Help us to keep it simple, Father, we pray. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time in worship and I just want to ask you to, as we're worshiping, have that time with the Lord. Let the Lord hear your prayers. Cry out to him. Spend time with him as we worship. And, and, and let the Lord bring life into this study that, that God has, has given us tonight. That whatever the Lord has shared with you tonight, that the Lord would bring it to life. Call upon him. Surrender yourself to him. If you haven't given your life to Jesus, John three sixteen, he loves you. So much so he gave his only begotten son. If you commit your life to Jesus, you'll not perish, but you'll be saved. Give your life to Jesus. Father, lead us and guide us. Meet with us right now, Father, as we worship you in Jesus' name.